Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. I'm Alison Okamura. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. And it is perfect that I'm going after Fei Fei, who talked about vision, because I'm going to talk about what I think of sometimes as vision's poor stepchild, which is touch. <laughs> so haptics uh, is not a made up word. Haptics means anything having to do with the sense of touch. You can think of haptics is to touch as optics is to vision, OK? So uh, when I talk about the field of haptics, I'm a, I'm a technologist. I'm interested in how do we engineer the sense of touch. And there's really two sides to that coin. One might be if you have a robot uh, that needs to interact with the world through touch, much like Fei Fei said, robots need to interact with the world through vision. That's one aspect of artificial touch. Uh, the other is the thing I'm going to focus on tonight, which is how do you let people feel virtual environments or feel what a remote robot is feeling? How do you generate an artificial sense of touch in people? So uh, there are many different senses, of course, that all impact our world. And uh, my graduate students here demonstrating what it might be like uh, <laughs> to lose some of these senses. Uh, and, and I would like you to do a little bit of comparison, a little thought experiment for yourself, which is that uh, to answer this question, which sense is most valuable to you? And another way to ask this question, because that's a bit of a hard question to ask, is that if each of your senses was taken away one by one, which is the one that you would relinquish last? And so ignore the fact that Fei Fei's here, and you know I'm a touch researcher. <laughs> Let's just take a, a little poll. It's not a popularity contest. Uh, who, who votes for sight? Which is the last? Is, who thinks sight is the last thing you would give away? That, that's usually the majority. I'll accept that. Um, hearing? All right. Smell? All right. Anybody for taste? All right, a few taste aficionados. I once spoke to a big group of Korean automotive engineers, and they all said taste. And I'm not, I'm not sure if it was because, uh, because of a cultural thing or what, but uh, I've had a, a big group interested in taste. And then uh, touch. Who's, who thinks that touch is the last thing you would give away? All right, thank you, everybody. So that, there's, there's no right answer here, of course. But it, it really makes you think about what these different senses can do for you. And so let's actually picture for a minute what a life would be like without touch. And uh, unfortunately, there are people in the world who, who go through this. Uh, this is a gentleman named Ian Waterman who had a disease called large fiber sensory neuropathy. He had a virus that caused him to lose the sense of touch over most of his body. And uh, he's actually very special because out of the um, dozen or so people in the world at any one time that have this, this problem, he actually managed to relearn how to walk and do some of the activities of daily living. And the reason it is so hard for him to live without the sense of touch is because he can't know where he's contacting objects in the environment. And that's called exteroperception, the ability to perceive your environment. But he also loses, when he lost his sense of touch, a lot of his proprioception. Proprioception is the sense of self. And that's, for example, the knowledge of where your limbs are in space. So we're all going to do a little exercise now, which is to uh, raise your hands up in the air above your head, point your fingers at each other, and then try to touch your fingers together without looking at them. All right? OK, you can bring them down now. <laughs> so, uh, so this is a pro uh, uh, an experiment that actually includes both uh, proprioception as well as exteroperception. Proprioception is being able to get your hands to a desired location in space without actually looking at them. And you can do that through uh, forces that you feel in your muscles, some stretch that you feel in your skin. And, uh, and then exteroperception, well, you're still feeling yourself, but it's actually feeling the contact with the fingers. And you probably notice that you're not perfect it, right? Most people kind of whiff it the first time around. And then you adjust and you manage to make contact. But without this sense of proprioception, it becomes very difficult to just control your own bodily movements. And so if this gentleman, Ian Waterman, wants to walk down the street, he has to focus visually on every movement his body makes. And he says that if he gets distracted by a pretty girl or someone turns the light off, he'll just crumple to the floor because he loses that visual focus. And so both vision and touch, and I'm not discounting the other senses either, are really important to actually get through our world and accomplish the activity activities that we do in our daily lives. So um, sorry, I'm a little cut off here. Um, there are some examples that you've probably experienced in your own life where you've lost a little bit of the sense of touch. So the cutaneous sense, which is uh, touch on your skin, um, can be lost through temperature changes. So if, for example, if you, your fingers get very cold, if you've been skiing, or for some reason you're holding ice, then you, uh, uh, you're, you're 
cutaneous mechanoreceptors, little sensors in, in your skin that actually register contact and vibration and useful contact information, those sort of go dead when it's very cold outside. And that's why you fumble with your zipper or buttoning your jacket in cold weather. So you've experienced that sort of loss of sense of touch. Um, in addition, you can lose your, your kinesthetic sense. This has more to do with proprioception and sense of self. Um, and so if your foot falls asleep because you've been sitting on it uh, the wrong way, uh, you lose this sense of being able to know where your limbs are in space. And so that gives you just a little bit of a clue um, as to what it would be like to lose some aspects of the sense of touch. Um, and obviously making that permanent would be um, an extremely challenging uh, situation. But there are many situations um, in which people, both, both special populations like amputees, as well as some other little I'll describe in a minute, where people lose this sense of touch on a regular basis. So someone wearing a prosthetic arm like this both loses their sense of touch at the fingertips, as well as knowledge of where their arms are in space. So we'd like to develop technology to help people like that. Um, in addition, there are a bunch of scenarios that involve teleoperation. So I'm a roboticist by training. I'm interested in how robots can help people accomplish all kinds of tasks. And often those robots are teleoperated. They're not in a scenario. They don't, maybe they don't have good enough touch sensing or computer vision to operate autonomously. So a human operator will sit in some safe location and remotely operate a robot, like a robot in space, uh, a robot that's doing explosive ordnance disposal, and even teleoperated robot-assisted surgery, where the goal here isn't so much to keep the operator safe, but allow the patient-side robot to make scaled motions that are much smaller than what the surgeon could accomplish with his or her own hands. So in these teleoperated situations, you have another set of scenarios where there's a sort of a sensory deficit, right? The user is remotely operating this robot, but you would like that person to have a sense of telepresence, to feel as if they're sitting and operating directly on that patient or manipulating a tool in space or um, manipulating wires um, on unexploded ordnance. But uh, at the moment, without haptic feedback, it's kind of like um, operating in an environment where you're sensory deprived. There's also a situation in which all of you are probably sensory deprived on a daily basis, and that's your interaction with computers. This is a famous illustration uh, by, from Dan O'Sullivan and Tom Ego, uh, who, who are very interested in physical computing and human-computer interaction and where that's going to go in the future. Well, if you have a keyboard and a mouse, obviously you put physical inputs into a computer, but it doesn't touch you back. If you have a, a touchscreen phone, maybe multi-touch, you have two fingers there, this is how your iPhone sees you. Right, your, your one eye, it's not a stereo display. Sometimes there's stereo um, auditory information and, and you can touch it with a, a single finger. But what we would really like to have is a more natural interaction. Maybe if we didn't have to focus all of our vision on our phones, we wouldn't always walk around like this. We could actually look up and, and get more haptic feedback from the devices we interact with. And so our current situation in terms of human computer interaction is extremely sensory deprived, and that's something you guys deal with every day. So that brings us to haptic technology. And uh, I'll start out with just a couple of examples of how it can be used in virtual environments and teleoperated environments, and just point out the different components that come into play. So uh, this is Anne, she's a grad student in my lab, and what she's doing is manipulating a haptic device, which in this case is kind of like a small robot, a little desktop device, it has linkages and motors, and on those motors are also sensors, and you can use what are known as kinematic equations to figure out where the end point is that she is grasping. And so she can move this, uh, this device around in space, move the stylus, and it's going to record her motions. Those motion signals will be sent to a virtual environment. This is the classic teapot for anybody who's ever taken a computer graphics course. And this red dot represents her position in that virtual world, which is translated from this device to this red virtual dot that is her avatar in that virtual world. Then you can do calculations in this virtual environment that says, if this red dot intersects that teapot, then we're going to calculate a force that should be commensurate with uh, the amount of stiffness of the surface of the object, maybe any texture that's on it as well. And usually these virtual environments are augmented with a nice visual display as well as sometimes sound. 
Now, if once those forces are computed, they actually have to be displayed to the user somehow. And so that force information is then sent back to the haptic device, and the motors are turned on and off in such a way that the user feels a force at the endpoint of this robot where she's grasping it. Right? So you can imagine that someone could then feel a 3D object by having the motors controlled to display forces in just the right way to recreate that shape in a virtual way so that she's like, it's like she's feeling it directly with the stylus. So that's uh, haptics for virtual environments. Um, for teleoperated robots, uh, the concept is really not that different. Now, instead of controlling a virtual red dot, she is controlling a red dot that is essentially attached to the hand of a remote robot. And so if she moves the dot to the right, then the robot arm should follow that movement to the right. And then uh, if the robot senses forces from interaction with the environment, she can that, then again feel that through this haptic device. Now this is a force feedback device that lets you feel true 3D shapes, and it's very compelling. Uh, there's also devices that are quite different from that, uh, just so you can get an idea of the spectrum of haptic devices that exist. And in this case, my student Michelle, she's wearing armbands in which there are little vibrating motors, just like the ones that you have in your cell phone or your Wiimote. If you've ever played Wii tennis with a Nintendo Wii, right? It makes a little vibration when you hit the virtual ball. Well, she can get vibration feedback uh, from these devices that are also distributed on her body that could help guide her to make particular motions as a rehabilitation strategy for stroke patients or um, even in this case just uh, training certain types of yoga poses. <laughs> so it could be used for entertainment, exercise, um, as well as medical applications. And it's a very different kind of haptic feedback, but it still involves um, sensing motions and applying forces or some kind of haptic stimulus to the user. So I'm going to focus mostly on an application that's near and dear to my heart, which is these medical robots, these teleoperated devices which go inside a patient through very small holes in order to perform minimally invasive surgery. And there are a lot of reasons why you would want to have a robot in the operating room. Uh, artificial intelligence isn't necessarily one of them. Really what we're trying to do is provide a tool for the surgeon to make them effectively more accurate, more dexterous, and provide them with enhanced sensory feedback. And so I'm gonna show a video now. This is just uh, fake rubber and, uh, and foam for anybody that uh, feels a little <laughs> queasy. Just, just fake stuff here, nothing real. <laughs> uh, and, and what is going on here is the surgeon is sitting at the master console and manipulating basically what amounts to a pair of fancy joysticks. Um, and, and then this remote robot, which is going into the patient through very small holes in the abdomen, can follow the user's motions. These two, these two videos here are at different scales. So this is the scale, the one on the, on the bottom was the scale of the hand, whereas these instruments here, it's about one centimeter is, is the length of that gripper. And so essentially the robot can recreate the user's movements um, in a way that is scaled down, essentially shrink, shrinking the surgeon and making him or her more accurate. So we would like to have haptic feedback in scenarios like this. Um, and clinically, that's actually a very challenging thing to do. Uh, here's an example of a, a user getting haptic feedback while they're tying a suture with a robot like this. And here's an example with no haptics. And pretty soon, this suture will break because of too much force applied. Uh, this video here shows little dots that change color depending on how much force is applied. But it turns out that just showing people changing colors is not nearly as intuitive as actually applying force feedback to the hands through the types of haptic devices that I just showed. There's other more sophisticated things you can do, like have bar graphs that go up and down. But for most types of surgical tasks, it turns out that actually providing the natural forces that you would feel helps people perform much better because touch should be displayed through touch and vision should be used for what vision is used for. So I'll give one example of some new types of haptic technology that we're developing that are pushing the envelope beyond typical force feedback that I've talked about. And this is another uh, cutaneous method. So I'll start the video and then I'll, and then I'll show uh, what the system does. So if we're holding on to a stylus and pushing on a surface, we get skin stretch feedback as well as large scale forces that let us know we're contacting the environment. So what we've done is created devices that stretch the skin artificially 
that provide that extra cutaneous feedback, that extra feedback to the skin, so it feels like you're getting forces even if all you're getting is skin stretch. And it turns out that devices like this are much cheaper and easier to integrate into something like a surgical robot than the conventional large-scale force feedback. So sometimes what we're trying to do is come up with little haptic illusions and haptic tricks to try to get users to think they're feeling things that uh, is not necessarily what you would feel in the real world. I can also give another example about surgery simulation. So not just now performing surgery, but how do you provide an environment so you can feel like you're doing real surgery, but you're doing it on a virtual patient. And I think we can all agree that this is a pretty good idea, just like you want your airline pilot to train in, a airline, in an airplane simulator. You would like your surgeon to, to do so in a, in a surgical simulator. Um, and again, going beyond the typical force feedback, feeling forces through a tool, we also develop novel techniques to try to display distributed forces that you can explore with multiple fingers. And so I'll just play this video of a crazy little device <laughs> that we developed recently, which tries to recreate a surface whose both geometry and mechanical properties change. And while it plays, I'll just explain to you briefly how this particular device works. It's called particle jamming. We have little membranes um, of, uh, in this case, silicone rubber, which are filled with coffee grounds. And when you vacuum the air out of those coffee ground filled cells, it becomes hard, or if you don't vacuum it, it becomes soft again. And then you can pressurize the chamber from underneath, which will make them balloon up. And so we have these little tricks that we play to try to come up with surfaces whose both geometry and mechanical properties uh, can be changed. And the idea is you could build medical simulators to help people identify tumors or hard lumps in soft tissue using a device like this. Finally, I want to talk briefly about uh, haptics and education. Because another place where the sense of touch is lacking uh, is in a lot of environments where you're trying to do learning. Uh, a lot of people uh, are hands-on learners. I think I partly became a mechanical engineer because I'm a hands-on learner. I like to feel things with my hands. Just watching a lecture or reading a textbook doesn't always do it for me. And we find that a lot of students we work with are hands-on learners as well. We do a lot of outreach events where we have uh, kids from, from high school students to elementary school students uh, come into our lab or we bring devices out to them. And we get to see how motivating it is for them to work with haptic devices and feel physical concepts through them. In fact, I love this video because these kids are like climbing all over each other to get their hands on the devices. And what we're trying to teach them is this is what a spring is. And there's a softer spring or a harder spring. And you can change the value of that spring in the virtual world. And you can feel the difference. And then the students can identify now what the mechanical feeling is in comparison to the physics that they're learning in classes. So we recently uh, did a little experiment. This happened last fall, where we taught an online class that tried to use hands-on haptics labs to take concepts that you might learn in physics and translate them to haptic devices. And what we did was build um, kits, about 100 of them. We only had 100 students. Not, not a MOOC, not a massively open online course, but a micro MOOC with only 100 students. Uh, this is the first time we did this, and, and uh, the Stanford Vice Provost for Online Learning and the School of Engineering supported us in this project, where uh, we created these HAP kits. That's our, our name for these uh, uh, bag of parts that, that the students get. And then these remote students assembled these haptic devices. And then, and then after they assembled them, they programmed them with simple physics concepts so they could feel springs and dampers and masses and uh, hopefully get a much better connection between uh, the things that they learn in physics class to um, something, something real that they can interact with through the sense of touch. And this was a really exciting activity because not only do we think that we taught more people about physics as well as haptic technology, but we could actually do a hands-on laboratory in an online class. And because haptics and hands-on learning is a really, has been a really important um, part of my education as a student, it's really exciting to be able to translate that to more and more people. So we're hoping to actually expand this in the future. So thank you very much for, for listening about haptics. <laughs>